Hello and welcome to the TIFO Football Podcast. I am Joe Devine and today's episode is supported by The Athletic, the best place to read about football online as evidenced by today's guest, Jack Pitt-Brook, who is here to talk to us all about Spurs. So if while listening to this episode you find yourself mesmerised by Jack's opinions and you enjoy listening to his dulcet tones and his uh, fantastic insight on Tottenham Hot Spurs. Uh, I know there's no S, I'm doing it for fun. Uh, you can visit www.theathletic.co.uk forward slash TIFO uh, for a 30-day free, for a 30-day free trial and 50% off your annual subscription. Do you know how much that works out to be per day, Seb? No. It's eight pence per day. That's a steal. That is a steal. What do you spend less on per day than that? Probably nothing. Probably nothing. Exactly. It's the cheapest thing ever. And that's a fact. Uh, today's episode... Was it very fun to record? We've just finished it. Um, we talked to Jack about Tottenham. We talked about Marcus Edwards for a bit in the middle, which was interesting. We talked about... Contracts. Where... <clears throat> we did contracts quite, quite a long time. We talked about contracts. Yeah, that's very interesting. That's very interesting. Hold on for that bit. Um, also, we talked about whether or not Tottenham are uh, in a transitional period and where that might end up. Their five-year sort of medium, long-term... Uh, goals. Goals hopes, these sorts of things. And of course, we began by talking about the London Derby. North London Derby. The North London Derby, because there are other derbies. In there London. are other derbies available, should you want them. I mean, yeah. there are other North London derbies as well. You know, mm. you could have uh, Enfield versus no, 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 no. Clapham. That's a North London Derby. This is the North London Derby. You it's could different. have, well, I don't know, it depends on your perspective. You could have uh, Wimbledon versus... Uh, South London. Huh? Wembley. Sorry, South London. sorry. Uh, Wembley. Wembley Town versus the who? other one that's near there. Right. Uh, I saw those. If, if what sort of Dollars Hill United? Yes. Or St John's Wood Rovers or something. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. But anyway, it was the North London derby, and we began by talking about that. So, without further ado, here is the episode. Thank you very much for listening. Jack, you were at the North London Derby this weekend. How did you find it? A little bit disappointing? Um, no, not disappointing. Uh, I thought it was a really interesting game. Uh, it was very exciting. It was very kind of chaotic and unpredictable on the pitch. Uh, from a so personally, like I went in to write about Tottenham because uh, my colleague Amy Lawrence was writing about Arsenal. And from a Tottenham perspective, it was quite a difficult game to write about too strongly in the sense that there was a lot of good and a lot of bad about how Tottenham did like I thought that you know on the plus side they were really good on the break they probably created more chances than they have in any other game this year with the exception of the Aston Villa game um they like human son was really good uh he you know was a real reminder of how dangerous he is on the break I thought Harry Winks was exceptional uh his best performance of the season so far I loved his little turn before the first goal that was, that was amazing was that was amazing, really really right? good he's so like he's so good in those small spaces and you know I think his role at Spurs is often sitting in front of the back four but he had a little bit more license to go forward yesterday and he proved what he could do with that particular moment uh on the downside I thought Spurs were really bad at the back um it will, both Arsenal goals were far too easy, I think, to, to come about. Uh, I didn't really have any confidence in them in their ability to hold off Arsenal. I thought, you know, with a bit more luck, Arsenal would have scored three or four. Uh, and what, what, what really stuck with me was not so much the defensive problem. It was that in this, basically Spurs kind of surrendered in the second half. In the sense they, they were forced so deep by Arsenal, they couldn't really get a foothold in the game. Like I know Harry Kane had that chance in the break where he hit the post. But for the most part, the second half was played entirely in Spurs' in Spurs's half. Mm. And that's really that's kind of unfamiliar, really, with Spurs, in the sense that um, there have been North London derbies under Pochettino. I remember one that, we won, one that they won 2-1 at White Hart Lane, one they won 2-0 at White Hart Lane, where Spurs really overwhelmed Arsenal with their physical energy in the second half. And yet yesterday, watching them, it was Arsenal who kind of went up through the gears in the second half and Spurs who couldn't really live with them. Mm. So in that sense, it was like an inversion of what we're used to in North London derbies. And it did make me think, well, it's kind of like it's not really it's not really proper Spurs if they don't have that ability to turn up the physical heat in the second half. Mm. Um, and it, it kind of it connected me back to this question, which we've had a lot recently, which is, 
when did Spurs last provide a really like full 90-minute performance in the Premier League? I don't think there's been one since they won 6-2 at Goodison Park on the 23rd of December. Uh, and I still feel after yesterday, after yesterday that we we are still waiting for a complete Spurs performance this year. Uh, we're still waiting for like a proper Spurs display. And until we get that, and it, you know, it might come next week. It might come at Leicester City the following week, or you know, we might have to wait a lot longer. I still feel like the the best of Spurs is still a little bit distant at the moment. So have you watched the game as well? I mean, I, I recognise what Jack is saying in terms of chance creation. I remember the Harry Harry Kane shot on the post, which, to be honest, is only really a chance if you're a player like Harry Kane. Yeah. I mean, you think he makes those look easy. That's a half chance at best, really. Do you concur that maybe in terms of chance creation, they were struggling in the second half of yesterday? And what do you think the reasons are, if we're right to believe that we haven't seen a full Spurs performance over 90 minutes? Because they did look tired, didn't they? Uh, for me, the chance creation thing kind of has its roots probably in midfield where I thought one of the features of the game was just how easily Arsenal moved the ball from one end of the pitch to the other. There was no, it felt at times like there was absolutely no resistance in front of the defence, which is, you know, it's uh, it's what is traditionally under Pochettino been a, been a strength of, of Spurs with sort of Dembele, Dyer, uh, Sissoko last season a little bit in a, his kind of unorthodox way. So, you know, without that, you're limited very much to to break into space using your pace against an Arsenal defence, which is, let's be kind, so it's, in a, it's in a state of flux. It's being, it's kind of between eras. You I should think. be able to run behind it. You should be able to run behind it. You are going to, if you if you square one of those players up individually, you're probably going to have some joy. If you can get a, a Son or a Mora or even a Lamella tentatively on the ball. Um, the, the general thing, I don't know. I mean, Pochettino has spoken a bit in the past about um, kind of team rejuvenation, squad rejuvenation, and so I see kind of one of the the the, the, sort of the faults of this team being the uncertainty around its around its centre. So over the summer they bought Dembele to to kind of not replace Musa Dembele, uh, Musa Dembele, but to to mimic and develop on some of the things he used to do. Um, he didn't play yesterday. Uh, Giovanni Lothelso has come in. He's presumably going to be playing kind of a central midfield, slightly like tip of the diamond, if you operates with that system kind of role um and until you have the right chemistries in that in that I, I don't know how you i don't know how you exert a proper influence on a game so yesterday was really to me oh sorry sunday because it's coming out on tuesday it seemed about it was very much like the man city game a couple of weeks ago I remember being at that thinking after about 25 minutes you could have spurs could already have conceded four times yeah and then the idea that you, they can get away with it by 90 minutes it feels a little bit like a victory but all the trends were quite quite concerning I don't want to put a negative spin on it because there there were some very good things yesterday, Monday, Sunday. Yeah. Did it again. Edit that out. Um, so I don't know. I, I think it's just a, a question of maturing. Like Pochettino obviously has uh, taken umbrage with the, the late closing of the transfer window. Um, he wants that over. I think also if you look back uh, to previous seasons, maybe with the last with last year accepted, they don't start that well. They may put points on the board, but there are sort of chaotic, Jack mentioned chaos, there are issues in the team that, that kind of are cause for concern. It feels like maybe three of the last five seasons we've been having a little bit of a conversation about Spurs at this time of year, August, September. Have they done enough in the transfer window? Are the players unsettled? That kind of thing. Yeah. It's a little bit more pronounced this year, but it, it's, it feels very familiar. Well, it's interesting you said that because Pochettino seemed to... He seemed more proud of the performance than he has been of previous performances uh, this season so far. And, you know, there was, I think he, he seemed to say that he found part of the play was promising in terms of moving forwards with it. I read your uh, post-match piece on The Athletic um, and also I read some of the, the comments beneath which were interesting. And there were people in the comment section who seemed to think that we're seeing now the end of one of his teams and we're transitioning to something new and maybe that's been happening for a while particularly if you think about issues with central midfield or with the fullbacks for example do you think that's part of the issue maybe that the, the team that Spurs created over the last sort of four or five years is coming to its end now and it needs to have new life breathed into it if it wants to compete because ironically they just seem to have become more and more stable at the top in the top four whether or not that is as a result of how well they are pl playing compared to how well they were playing two or three years ago or how poorly other teams are performing is up for question, I suppose. Yeah, I certainly agree that they um, that Tottenham are in a state of transition at the moment. 
Um, they finally bought three players in the summer transfer window, which I think, you know, all those three guys will have to be first teamers, I think, by the end of the season. Um, this is something which Pochettino's wanted to do for a long time. You know, let's remember last summer, Pochettino wanted a big a summer of transition. He wanted a summer of outs and ins. But Spurs couldn't sell any of the players they were trying to sell. They couldn't sell to Soko, Rose, Order World, Wanyama. And so they had they were left in this state of stasis instead where they had to keep all the old players and they couldn't buy anyone new. Finally, they're, they've done part of the job like by getting in the, these three players this summer with Clark as well. But they haven't done the other half, which is they haven't really got rid of everybody they wanted to get rid of. Like Ericsson is still there. Order World is still there. Rose is still there. Um, I mean, it might change over the course of today because it's the last day of the European transfer window, but it probably won't. Um, Wanyama, I think, is still there, but he might go. So they haven't really, they haven't really completed that process, and so we're going to see this strange kind of uh, like transitional phase this year, in which lots of the old players are still at the club, uh, but I think they will probably then leave at the end at the end of the season. Um, and I think the the main job this season really is to bed in the new guys, so that when you know, if and when Rose, Ericsson, or DeWeer would leave next summer, then finally Spurs will be, you know, Spurs will be able to push on with a new team, which is noticeably different from the team of the last few years. Mm. On that point as well, there have been uh, various comments made by Maurizio Pochettino over the last few months, some of which uh, have appeared as cryptic, some which seem slightly more straightforward. We understand what he's saying. What do you think of the atmosphere at Tottenham at the moment? Because that seems more unsettled than it has over the last few years. Yeah, so Pochettino does have a habit of... like He does often say things in press conferences to to be provocative or to get a reaction. I think he is, he is genuinely quite an up-and-down, hot-and-cold guy. Uh, and I know that you know, some, sometimes his comments... Are, like the Spurs board don't especially care because they're used to him complaining about things. Sometimes, sometimes he does annoy people with what he says. Uh, I don't, honestly, I don't think the mood at Spurs is great at the moment. I think that, I mean, I've heard that from a few people who are close to the squad that there's a bit of a sense of staleness. I think uh, there's been you know this far into any manager's reign, there's always going to be issues around. Um, you know, is it fresh enough? Are there enough new ideas? I think that's why the new signings might help because they will freshen up a place which has been getting a little bit too familiar. I think perhaps in the last year or two. Um, was it? Was there a clearing the air dinner? So yeah. So Pochino met Levy the other week to to talk about it, which is you know that that is no small thing. You know, sometimes they'll go quite a long time without talking. Um, but I do think that uh, things haven't been especially happy at Tottenham recently. Uh, and that you know, and you can see this in situations with Ericsson and Vertonghen as well. And that's why I think uh, this is such a kind of crucial period, really, because the players who are still there, who they failed to sell, they're going to have to knuckle down if they're still going to be there, or it's going to be a big, big problem for Pochettino. And I think you kind of reading between the lines of what Pochettino has been saying a lot recently, he would rather Ericsson have been sold, presumably as well. And this is from an outsider's uh, perspective, but presumably Pochettino has some power within the conversation because he is, with the exception of having won a trophy, I suppose, he is considered one of the best coaches in the world. If he wanted to leave, there would be a number of suitors. Does that not give him some leverage over the situation with, with Levy, Seb? I would have thought so. He's the commodity at Tottenham. I mean, if you if you take him out of the equation, then everything else seems to become very tenuous very, very quickly because I think um, I think one of the realities of modern football is that, with very few exceptions... Players aren't loyal to clubs. Players are loyal to other personalities. So be that a manager, coach, teammate. Themselves. Themselves, yes. <laughs> Very often themselves, yeah. Um, so, yeah, he, of course, he, I mean, it's, that's not a football issue. That's an um, employability problem. Like if you have a, a coveted asset in your organisation who's not happy, then there has to be a certain level of indulgement. But we know how Levy deals uh, with other clubs in the transfer market. He's considered a, a shrewd business person. He's always given as the example of uh, of either the right or wrong way to do things uh, in that role at a club, depending on you know the outcome of the situation. Do you see his uh, his relationship with Pochettino in a similar way? Does he act in a, in a similar way? You know, does he play hardball with Poch? I have no. That's really a question. Jack. I have no idea about his actual relationship with Daniel Levy. What do you think, Jack? Um, I think it's okay. I think it's okay. I think they, you know, they do have a very good working relationship together. 
they've been through an awful lot together. Um, Pochettino does like to <laughs> he does like to stick his oar in a bit with a, a moan in a press conference about transfers, but I think Levy is smart and tough enough to to let that wash over him a bit. Really, I think you know, I think he's quite thick skinned with this kind of thing. Um, so I don't think yeah I, I I've always had the approach of not reading too much into Pochettino's press conference complaints. Mm. Uh, because that is just who he is, and like it's uh, it's it's almost become part of the furniture. And after a while, you kind of become a bit inured to it. Well, forget about whether or not, or the manner in which he does complain. But is he right to complain? I mean, is there is there? Do you think? And maybe Spurs fans may or may not have uh, this feeling as well. But do you think if they know how Levy conducts himself in the transfer market, they know that the business of the club is first and foremost, potentially over the success of the first team? Do, is is Pochettino right to push against that? Um, well, it, it's a situation by situation um, issue, really, because my fans' response is that, um, in one sense, you there's a great appreciation for what Daniel Levy has managed to do, or also what Daniel Levy has managed to balance over the last couple of years, because I, I think it's a little bit understated the the, the difficulty with which um, Spurs have had to, well, the difficulties they've encountered in navigating between stadiums and, you know, whilst also remaining competitive and getting to Champions League final. That is a, that is something for which, that is a, Pochettino is the emblem for that upside, of course, but, you know, Levy is still behind it. At the same time, there are instances where with Levy, you, you sense he has this kind of habitual need to be a bit difficult. Um, Giovanni Lothelso was signed over the summer, but obviously there were some difficulties between Levy and Real Betis. Um, there's also a um, there's a, a passage in uh, John Smith, the, the former super agent, used to do a lot of business with Arsenal back in the day, where he's talking about Levy's approach um, to the transfer market and you know, routinely would call up on the very last day going, right, so what are we going to do today then? So <laughs> I, I don't know. Daniel Levy is not a very public-facing person um, by design. I don't think he particularly enjoys giving interviews. Um, you know, you very rarely hear, hear his voice on television. Well, it suits his, his, his whole persona and demeanour, though, doesn't it? Well, I think it adds it's... to that idea of him as the shrewd businessman. Yeah, but I also think it's smart. Like, generally speaking in football, like, the quiet owner is the good owner. You don't want your owners spilling out their opinions on, on social media. That's a little bit West Ham, if we're honest. I mean, I know they've got better at that, but it's that's not a that's not, that, that's not really a, a reflection of your football club um, that, that you want to give. Um so I, I don't know, like it, it's a mood thing. From a fan's perspective, it's always a mood thing. There are days we wake up and you just think, you know, okay, so this is running smartly. This is a, um, you know, you almost wear as a, a point of pride this, this, this Tottenham identity of trying to be a little bit different to the teams they're competing with. There are other days where, you know, you wake up and you think, fucking Levy, you know, just, mm. it's, it's just the nature of it. Um, he is a frustrating man from a, from a supporter's perspective. But sometimes, um, sometimes Pochettino can be the difficult one. There was uh, Dave Heitner had a really good story in the, in the Guardian on Friday about the signing of Jack Clark from Leeds United, which said that uh, signing Clark was Levy's idea, and then Pochettino quite surprisingly kicked, turned against it, and that's why Tottenham had to loan Clark back to Leeds. And now Clark is left in limbo as a lone player at Leeds. He it's much harder for him to get into the team because there's a limit on five lone players per match day squad. Um, and it was really Pochettino who effectively pulled the plug right. on the Clark signing rather than Levy, which is an interesting story because it shows, you know, that they're maybe not always on the same page, but it also shows that it's not like Pochettino is the guy that wants the signings and Levy's the one getting in his way. Sometimes the situation can be reversed. Mm. Well, with the Ericsson example, you know, you said that you believe that maybe um, Pochettino did want Ericsson to leave. One of the criticisms of Spurs so far this season, and of course it's, it's very early, it's four league games so far, um, one of the criticisms has been that without Ericsson and the team, they look hopeless at uh, breaking down uh, deep defences, that there's n- there's not enough creativity or in- ingenuity in trying to break down those deeper defences. When we've seen the team with Ericsson in, that's slightly different. I say it's a small sample size, but what does that say about Pochettino if that's a player he does actually want to leave, but without him, they've well seemingly no hope in those sorts of situations, at least initially? Yeah, well, this is why Lo Celso is so important because Lo Celso has to be the long-term replacement for Ericsson. It's basically the only other guy who can who can do anything like what he does. But you're right, it is a strange situation. Like, you know, I mean, Aston Villa at home is a perfect example of this. Spurs are pretty hopeless for the first hour. Then they brought on Ericsson. He was brilliant and they won and they won 3-1. Um, but yeah, it, it, it is 
it is obviously a difficult situation when a player you're so dependent on is kind of like has one foot out the door. Mm. Um, I, I imagine over the course of the season they're going to try and um, like build up Lacelso so that by the end of the season he will be fully ready and they won't be reliant as much on Ericsson. But it's very difficult to do that because Ericsson is a brilliant player. He's been there for six years. You can't like turn off your dependence on him overnight. Also, I suppose the other thing, you know, I've always thought fondly of Spurs over the last five years in the sense that it's really seemed that the group of players wanted to play for the manager. They wanted to be there. There was a sort of oneness and a unity about them, which given these recent stories, potentially Ericsson being the catalyst for that, um, and, you know, up and downs with form with some of the other major players. It, it feels less like that this season, and we talked about the, the atmosphere already. Is that something that could have a really serious effect on the team? Because I suppose, particularly as well, given the way that they play, the amount of energy that is required, and the amount of enthusiasm to play like that every weekend, you have to really, and I, with the, you know, the fear of sounding like I'm a Sky Sports pundit, you have to really want to do that for someone to to keep that up. Do you think there's a fear of of that sort of intensity dropping this year? Yeah, I think I I think there is. I think you're absolutely right. Like the Pochettino model requires players to be willing to run through brick walls for him, and I do think that with some of the more senior players who've been there, who've been there the longest, who are maybe a little bit more frustrated by their situations, uh, and who perhaps haven't signed contracts. You know there are legitimate questions as to whether or not they are as hungry as, as they used to be as some of the younger players. I think you can tell that by the Ericsson and Alder Wheel contract situations, uh, and that and Pochettino knows this. Like this isn't news to him, and that's why he was he's been so keen for the last year or two to get rid of a lot of those senior players to refresh the squad to replace those old guys with younger players who want it more. Mm. He hasn't really been successful in doing that, to be honest, but he he recognizes that. That refreshing is crucial, not just for the sake of like the playing quality on the pitch, but also in terms of motivation and making sure that everybody in the club is desperate to be there. I read a really great piece on the Athletic a few weeks ago. I can't remember if you wrote it or if it was someone else, but it was about the contract situation. Oh, yeah, that was by me. That was who? Me. That was you. I thought you said that was my mate. That was you. Uh, <laughs> it was brilliant, by the way. Would you talk talk me through the general idea of how Tottenham have done that in the past? Because I had no idea about this and I found it fascinating. Okay, so basically, like. Tottenham can't pay big wages. Everyone knows this. They have they have a wage structure, which me you know which means that they can't compete with the other members of the big six on salaries. But what they've been very clever in doing over the last few years has been always constantly offering their players small pay rises, but renegotiating their contracts basically every year, giving them like incremental increases each time to make sure the players have always got kind of four or five years left in their contract, which means that Spurs are in a position of power, which means it's very difficult for the players to leave uh, if you've got that much time left in your contract. Or if they do, then they're going to be much yeah, more Yeah, so you know, they did sell Kyle Walker. They got a lot of money for him. He still had four years left in his deal. They got quite a lot of money for Kieran Trippier. He still had time in his deal. Even going back to Bale or Modric, they had long time left on their deals. They got really good fees for them. Um, and if you look at, say, Harry Kane or Deli Alley or Harry Winks, they sign kind of they sign like a five year deal every year basically, uh, and that means that Spurs are always in an effective position of power relative to the player. But in the last few years, and sorry to interrupt, but the player accepts it because they are getting incremental. Pay yeah, because they're like, well, it's only might only be another five grand a year, but I'll take it because it's a bit more money and it kind of secures my my future here. The problem is in the last few years, some of the players have stopped signing those deals. They've realised that. They don't, you know, Spurs have basically got them where they want them if they always sign. And so Ericsson hasn't signed a deal since his last one in 2016. Alder hasn't signed a contract since his, the first contract he signed when he joined Tottenham in 2015. Uh, Vertonghen hasn't signed a one again recently. I don't think Dyer has signed one since 2016. Um, because they don't want, they want more power. They don't want to give all that power over to the club in, ex- in exchange for a small amount of money. Um, if Spurs offer them a lot more money, they might be more, more willing to take it, but they don't want to sign for the terms that, that have been offered. Mm. And what this means is that Spurs have effectively lost control of the situation. Like Spurs have lost the power, particularly in the case of Alderweireld and Vertonghen and like Ald- and Eriksson. Like Alderweireld is now likely to go on a free because one thing, the one thing that Spurs, the one thing that's also sorry, I should have mentioned earlier is that what Spurs are doing is also like, as well as control, as well as it being about power, it's also about the value of the asset. Mm. Like the asset is of more value to Spurs the more time they have left in their contract. If 
But because Alderweireld Eric, and Ericsson haven't signed new contracts, they will probably, this might change, but they will probably both go on Bosman's next summer. And Spurs will lose, you know, players who they could have sold for a combined £100 million last year or more, right? for nothing. Mm-hmm. So Spurs have totally lost control of the situations in these instances. Um, and that's really problematic for them. Okay, well, whether it's that or it is a dedicated local reporting about your team or rich storytelling from around the world, you can find it all in one place. And that place is The Athletic, the best place to read about football online. Visit www.theathletic.co.uk forward slash TIFO and you can get a 30-day free trial with that and 50% off your annual subscription. That's 8p a day. Uh, Seb, I believe you wanted to say something. No, I had a question. I, I mean, one of behind this situation, like um, it's a little bit conspiratorial, but I wonder if um, most of this squad have experienced near misses or they've been exposed to what this club's limitations probably are in an achievement sense. Is that one of those issues where, for instance, you know, not um, you know, not overtaking Leicester City back in 2016, losing out to Chelsea the next year, sitting inside of the Champions League final, but knowing deep down that UEFA's I'm not sure how we should phrase this, but long-term change, long-term changes for the Champions League, they're probably not that far away. Do you think part of this is, okay, we've got this contract situation. We are, we do not want to be tied to a club who, first of all, are offering um, these lesser wages, but we're no longer willing to accept those lesser wages on the basis that the trade-off isn't this potential achievement as a group because that's becoming more and more unrealistic. Yeah, I think that touches on a really, really important point, and that is a fear which I think is probably well placed, that Spurs have kind of missed their window. Yeah. Their window was, this is, I'm kind of working on a piece on this at the moment, but Spurs' window was basically 2015 16, 2016 17. The Leicester season. Yeah. So before, before Klopp's Liverpool and Pep City really, really clicked, that was, that was Spurs' window. And Spurs were, you know, Spurs were the best team in the country over that two year span, like without question. They were, you know, they, they were better than Leicester in 2015 16. But Leicester just got more points than them. Um, I thought they were Spurs were even better the following season, but Chelsea just got more points than them. And Spurs were unlucky. They were really, really unlucky. Like the Leicester, th- what happened to Leicester is a freak. Like it's a total one in a million freak. And if that hadn't happened, then Tottenham would have won the league. And even in 2016-17, like I don't think Chelsea were that much better than them. Chelsea, like, Conte basically landed on a formation that worked for him quite early on in the season. That befuzzled everyone else. Yeah, and then all you know, and he happened to get the last good season really out of Diego Costa, or at least last good last good half season, the last good season out of Cesc Fabregas, and you know all these little little things came together and made Chelsea better than Spurs. But and so it's kind of it's it's very unfortunate that a team as good as Spurs were over that two year spell should have not won the Premier League because now now that City and Liverpool have learnt to play a way that really makes the most of their like resources advantage Spurs are miles away and Spurs, you know Spurs are extremely unlikely to win the league at any point soon and that's and that's a real shame for them because they they should have done but they didn't in that context it's quite in Ericsson's an interesting one because Ericsson is 27 now now if you're if you're him and you're at probably what is almost certainly the prime of his career certainly the prime of his athletic abilities um, and you're hearing words like squad rejuvenation and remodeling and you're also you you and your agent are aware of kind of spending patterns especially last summer i know this summer it's a little bit different are you thinking right well am i signing up now if i were to sign a new contract at less than i could probably command at a major european side elsewhere what am i signing up for i mean by the time if this is the new five-year plan with a player like lothelso and dembele i'm going to be 32 33 by the time that that comes to fruition where are, where are the guarantees that I'm going to be receiving medals in, re- in a reward for that, as well as just a, a lesser contract? And a, in exchange for a greater earning potential as well. Yeah, and I, I Ericsson, for what it's worth, I, I think Ericsson's a little bit of a tragedy in the sense that he is a very, very good player without being an exceptional one. He's someone that um, deserves, you know, the opportunity to play at a level, but doesn't have the kind of the, the sheen required or the... Or we we touched on this before. He doesn't have a a, a habit and a, a, an established pattern of being an influence on really important games. 
So there's a very fine piece um, this morning written by, or from yesterday, written by Barney Rono. He's talking about Ericsson's influence on games and his little touches and his subtlety and, and the way he processes the game and how quickly he sees opportunity develop around him. What I would say is, yes, yesterday was an example of that. He, he, he did have a good game. There have been many, many times in the past where Ericsson, think of the Champions League final, you might as well not have played. Yeah. And you have all of this ability which somehow for whatever reason, maybe it's his personality, he remains latent within the game. Which um, sort of sits in a category for me of players who I uh, mistakenly believe are still young because they haven't fulfilled their potential yet. A bit like, um, I mean, Jesse Lingard is a, is a player like that as well. When Jesse Lingard was much younger, he looked like someone who might turn into, similar to the player that he is now, but develop that world-beating quality that it just you know is 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 much further away from being there with Jesse Lingard well, I, I don't I don't mean to compare the two players in terms of quality at all no no I, I just I, I think that might be an example of the way young Manchester United players are processed by the media it's just a, if you're if you're a young player but Ericsson United, was the same it, like what, before before Ericsson moved to Spurs yeah, he was touted Barcelona first among the kind Madrid, of football yeah. manager circles and then you know then around the FIFA circles and then he was this this great new thing when he moved to Spurs you thought He's going to, over the next five years, he's going to show that. In many ways, he, he has, but but I still, as I said, mistakenly occasionally think of him as someone with unfulfilled potential, therefore younger, because he hasn't quite reached the heights that you would hope for him. And maybe that's an issue with expectations rather than anything else. I, no, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think the Ericsson that turned up at Spurs in 2013 was a really flawed player. Like, he, mm. would, he, would, he, would, he would influence game impulses. Um, I wouldn't describe him as lazy, but he was very peripheral. So he would... He would fade really badly in games. And so what he doesn't probably get enough credit for is, is how he's been transformed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a guy that took a lot of criticism, um, not least from his international manager, um, about what was required to be not just a well thought of prospect, but an actual, you know, a inverted commas player on the world stage. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he and Pochettino deserve uh, great recognition for what they've been able to create. But I just think it's a case of someone, there being this sort of, um, this stratospheric level in the game and then a more ordinary but still very good level and Ericsson is never going to get beyond is never going to transcend those categories mm. um, well we're talking about uh, his potential replacement in Los Celso we've also got uh, Tongi and Dombele Ryan Sessegnon and we've mentioned Jack Clark already who is back on loan at Leeds uh, how do you feel about the, the the new signings Jack and where do you I mean presumably as you said already you see them bedding in over the course of the year maybe and being a future central peak. Of yeah, the I think Ndombele started well. Uh, I thought he was really going against Aston Villa. I think Lo Celso is clearly a very good player as well. Uh, it'd be interesting to see how exactly you would fit all the players into the same midfield. Uh, I don't really know what the answer is. Uh, I think you'd have to wait. I think basically, yeah, I think Ericsson will get faded out as Lo Celso uh, grows into the team over the course of the season. Uh, but I'm impressed. Like, I think, you know, it went... Sometimes I get kind of down on Spurs, and I'm worried that you know the, the kind of cycle's coming to an end. But I am I am really enthused about the three players they've signed. Like I think that those guys will make a big difference, not just this year, but next year and beyond. So I mean, and they're kind of my main cause for optimism, really. Can we talk about Marcus Edwards as well, who is an example of a young player who has been touted, Seb, as you've written in my notes kindly here, referred to. Uh, uh, as a teenage Leo Messi a few years ago by Pochettino, Little which Messi. he yeah. later acknowledged was a, a mistake. Um, but uh, he is someone who Spurs fans are still fascinated with um, and we'd be curious to hear your opinion on him because you were also, we believe, the only person to have interviewed him. Yeah, so it's actually it's an interesting time to talk about Edwards because today is obviously transfer deadline day and I, I wouldn't be surprised if he goes today. So but, you know, if you're listening to this, then you'll, you will know by now what's mm. happened. Uh, but it's what is midday on deadline day today, and I, I think he will probably go somewhere. It's been an interesting summer for Edwards because he has, uh, you know, his time at Tottenham is pretty seemingly done. Uh, he nearly went to Brentford, so he was training there, but he got a hamstring injury. The signing didn't happen. Uh, he spent some time in Italy at Udinese. Uh, not sure that's going to happen. The other championship teams have come in for him. How old is he? Uh, that's a great question. I think he's, I think he's 19. 19. 19. Yeah. Um, so there's been a lot of interest, but so far none of that interest has turned into a real move yet. I think he struggles. A, he, he struggles a bit with his reputation and image. There's you know there, there is no getting past that. Uh, he various things have happened during his time at Tottenham and on loan at Norwich, which haven't helped him. Uh, 
I do think that his time in Holland at Excelsior was positive. Uh, he played really well. Uh, he showed that he can do it like in senior men's football, which he's never really shown before. Uh, he adjusted to a very you know kind of different way of life. It wasn't easy for him being over in, in Rotterdam, uh, although I think eventually it got better thanks to his family. But I, he, he is really interesting because he's so talented. He's like he's so like just watch like watch a clip of him if you haven't seen him before. Mm. It's close control, his awareness, his change of pace. Technique is unbelievable. His ability to beat people from a standing start. Like, he is just a ridiculously talented footballer. Like, he, he is... It's not an exaggeration to say he is as talented as any other footballer that England's ever produced. Um, but there are huge... There are big question marks about whether or not he can... He will make it as a professional at the, t- at the very, very top end of the game, which is what he wants to do. Um, and, I th- you know... he. He does have a bad. He does have a bad reputation. Like pers- when I met him, so I interviewed him in June, I think. Um, that interview's on the Independent for anyone who wants to look it up. Yeah, it yeah. Uh, I interviewed him in June, and I thought he was. I thought he was a really nice lad, but he's very, very shy and quiet. He, it, you know, having a conversation with a journalist over a cup of coffee did not come easily to him, and he. You know, he was honest enough to admit that he's made mistakes and that his attitude hasn't been perfect in the past. Um, but I and I can see why his shyness might be interpreted as rudeness by a manager because it he's not someone for whom like having a you know having a sort of normal one to one chat is like a natural or easy thing. Um, Jack, I remember reading a piece and I, I loved it. I, I remember thinking because I was. It's the first time I'd heard a first-hand perspective on, on Edwards, and he's an interesting guy, obviously. My takeaway from it was it was revealing, but not really in a way which was flattering for him. There was still a little bit, I, I felt like still a bit too much finger-pointing from him and a bit kind of, there wasn't enough ownership of his situation and enough kind of, well, I could have done this differently. It was a sort of, well, I've been done wrong by that person and that person and that person. I don't know if that's a fair reflection. It's just, it was... It, it felt in this day and age where we were kind of preconditioned to look for red flags and to to distrust attitudes. People are far too quick to to term a you know a, a player as sort of a problem in a dressing room that kind of thing. But it was that came across a little bit. Yeah, I know what you mean, and uh, yeah, I think that's a I think that's a fair point. I do think that his um, like so, for example, the Norwich loan, which went yeah. very badly, and you know if you speak to people at Norwich, they are really really down on Edwards they didn't they were not happy with how that went at all what was what was so bad about it um just people talk about his attitude right okay. uh, bad attitude to not being picked mainly right um but and you know when I spoke to Marcus about it Marcus explained that he went there with a back injury and he tried to train but he couldn't really train properly because of the injury but he felt like um and then he was unhappy with being criticized by the manager Daniel Farker and you know that Maybe you're right. Like may, maybe that was excuse making, um, and I can see why. Yeah, I, I suppose I, it, the, the point is probably if you've got a rep, if you've got prior reputation, and then those things, people are probably less eager to or less willing to hear that side of the story. I'd have thought because he's been this from a fan's perspective. Marcus Edwards has been he he to Tottenham. He was what Wayne Rooney was to Everton fans. 15 years ago basically like he's that guy that you know jack's absolutely right you watch a single clip of this guy and let's be honest most fans digest football in that way when it when it comes to youth prospects if you see a clip of a guy on youtube who does what mark said was um can do and has done in the past you see someone that just cannot fail to be great and obviously that's a huge simplification and you know ignores so many different factors involved in in, in development but it's that's that's the sort of that's the that's the angle from which people come at it from. And you, you compared him outside to potentially to Ravel Morrison, and there are some similarities between the two stories. Morrison, I, I, well, I, I mean, there, there's the, the similarity exists in what they could have been, but what at the moment they're currently not. Um, Ravel Morrison's life um, a bit different. I don't know nearly as much about Marcus Edwards' life, but I, you know, anecdotally, I'm aware of some of the things to which Ravel Morrison is attached. Some of which are different, different legal issues. Which, well, yeah, but I, 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 I don't know. I think I, I mean, 
Um, there are funny stories about Ravel Morrison in connection with people like Sam Allardyce and Mark Curtis, which are which bear some scrutiny. I think sometimes there are clearly a lot of things that Ravel Morrison. It's not a Ravel Morrison podcast, but there are there are his legal troubles and things for which he you know rightly should receive a lot of criticism and you know um but there are other things which don't quite add up in his career if that makes sense i mean if people want to google those stories then i'm sure they can yeah reach their conclusions about that let's move away from that i don't want to talk about Ravel morrison just enjoying watching you sort no, of squirm no, no i don't want to You've go there no. yourself into a big <laughs> weird just dug myself into a hole everything's fine don't worry Ravel morrison follows me on twitter right? it makes me nervous does though. it yeah Hello. Yeah, if think... you're listening, Ravel, please come on the podcast. I don't, uh, uh... What are Tottenham's medium? You've written medium here, Seb. Seb did all of my notes, by the way. Thank you to Seb. No problem, Seb Stafford-Bloor. You can follow him on Twitter, read his work. It's wonderful. He's written a lot about Ravel Morrison. It's very, very interesting. Uh, <laughs> Five-year term directives now. The stadium has been built. The regular Champions League participant. You've written that uh, MP seems committed to their cause. So their local MP, David it's... Lammy... He is very committed to the cause of Tottenham. Uh, but what exactly are their five year? I mean, you've already kind of answered this question, Jack, by saying that they're very, very far away from winning uh, the uh, the league. Could they do a Liverpool? Could they maybe just try and win the Champions League instead? And and you know, don't worry so much about the domestic success. Um, that's a good question. So, on a five year view, I think that I think the first thing they have to do is stay in the Champions League. Um, you know, which means money, visibility, relevance, uh, being attractive to players. Uh, I think they will have to. I think they will have to go through a bit of pain in terms of the squad. You know, er- Ericsson, Vertonghen, Aldewild, and Rhodes will probably all go. Goalkeeper at some point as well. And, lo- and then yeah. the next thing will be Lloris in the next year or two. I think um, it'll be interesting to see what happens with Ali and Kane. Uh, you know, will they stay there forever? Uh, Ali obviously signed the new contract last year. Uh, Kane, you know, at what will there be a? Uh, you know, Seb was talking earlier about Ericsson and whether Ericsson thinks, do I want to be attached to Tottenham and all the way through my peak years? You know, Kane will have to make a similar decision soon. I think uh, over the next year or so, depending on how Tottenham do. Presumably, that's going to be harder for him than it would be for Ericsson. Um. Because of the I don't know. So Kane thing. has talked about like wanting to be at Tottenham his whole career. Equally, then you know there might be another part of his brain which says, "Well, I would quite like to go and play for Real Madrid or Manchester City or, or someone else." I, honestly, I don't know. I don't know. Um, and eventually, they're they're going to have so they're going to have to revamp the squad over time. They're going to have to think of you know they're going to have to prepare for the possibility of Pochettino not being the manager anymore. Because he has been there a long time, and you know nothing lasts forever, and eventually he might well go. I do think that Tot- Tottenham would be an incredibly attractive job to you know post Pochettino. I don't know when that would be, whether that would be, you know, he'd see out the rest of the rest of his contract, which I think is another three years left to run. Um, so I'm sure they could get another very good manager, and maybe not, you know, you can't directly replace someone like Pochettino, but they could get someone good in. And then the other the, the other big issue is the ownership. Like I think. You know, Spurs have been geared for the last sort of 10 years towards being sellable. Um, I don't, I mean, I don't know what exact what exactly they would do, whether they would try and sell the whole club or just sell a stake. Um, you know, the whole club must be worth, you know, one and a half, 1.7 billion pounds by now. Um, so I, I imagine that at some point with the new stadium, with the training ground, with the squad... And the, per- the almost permanent Champions League football, they would be very attractive to investors. Mm. So I think the I think the medium's long term. I mean, I, th- I think Spurs are going to go through a difficult season this year. I think the medium to long term picture for Spurs is very attractive because I just think they they are so much smarter than their rivals. Their rivals being, you know, that second tier of clubs: Arsenal, Manchester United, yeah. and Chelsea. Like even if even if City and Liverpool are kind of in a diff- on a different level for now. I still think that like Spurs will continue to be the best of the rest o- on over the next three to four it's years. It's a really good time to have these difficulties yeah. in terms of what the rest of the league looks like because you're it's kind a of great point. You know, your 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 you Jack said like your rivals are with the you know, maybe in six months we've seen a, a Leicester or Wolves break out of the pack and generally challenge the, the, the top six. At the moment that still seems a little bit unrealistic. 
But if you're going to have a, a sort of transitional season where you're trying to bed in a Le Thelso and then Bele, you got a few defensive issues. It's good that Frank Lampard's managing Chelsea and they are on the transfer ban. Arsenal, I think, are getting better, but are obviously quite flawed defensively. They're going to concede a lot of goals. And Manchester United are, goodness knows what they are. I, yeah. I still don't really know. I mean, yeah, maybe. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is very convenient for Tottenham that while... Tottenham have Mauricio Pochino as manager. Chelsea, Manchester United have the two worst managers in the Premier League. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a very fair... You, you, you know, because I... Uh, what, what I'd say the difference is, is that like at Spurs, you're working towards something. Now, maybe at Chelsea, Frank Lampard is revealed to be their next dynastic manager. Maybe. At the moment, you can't possibly say that because he's coming off the back of a, um, a decent championship season as his only... Um, senior level co- head coaching experience and Oli Solskjaer um, you know with the exception of a few individual results it's still just about at Man United how it all feels it's and it's about it. well, it's about creating the opportunity for people to be delusional in a way and maybe delusional is a too strong a word but it's a sort of you know we got rid of Mourinho because uh, it all made us feel quite uh, fatalistic about everything in comes Solstra. He's a, we're, he, we're out of the dungeon, up, up to the ground floor. Yeah, well, Solstra has these natural associations which make people feel warm inside. He says the right things. His rhetoric is exceptional. He's got a little boy's face. He's got a little boy's face. You can't hate Oli Solstra, can you? You can't hate a boy. And so you kind of, you well, the, the, uh, we presumably we've all seen the, the footage of the old guy that breaks down in tears at Southampton over the weekend. No, I haven't seen that. It's quite, yeah, really, okay, so there's, it's not funny, actually. I mean, I... I I'm a child of the 80s and 90s, so I kind of, you know, I will always enjoy Man United's failure a little bit. Sure. However, there's a, you know, elderly fan who travelled down St Mary's. How, how elderly are we talking? I'd say 70s. Wow. Yeah. Seventeen. Um, and he's outside St Mary's on one of those fan channels, and he's talking about their draw, their draw. Yeah. And he just, he, his voice quivers, and then he breaks into tears, breaks down into tears. So just to be clear, is this a Manchester United fan? It is a Manchester United fan, yeah. It's something for the tube journey back, Jack. You're a city fan. You, you kind of, yeah. <laughs> but it's 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 the difference. The, the general point is that Spurs have a direction. Whether you completely, whether it's overwhelmingly positive at the moment, there is a um, there is a procedure in place. Yeah. Whereas Chelsea and Manchester United, who you know are, they need to be finished ahead of. They are very much the ad hoc organisations at the moment. They're trying things because something else has failed before, yeah. and that's the difference. That's Seb Stafford Bloor there. You can follow him on Twitter for more jokes about the elderly crying. That's not a joke about the elderly. Okay, uh, questions from listeners now. Patrick Shimani asks, Do you think Pochettino has taken Spurs as far as he can now, seeing that they just don't have the same funds as Man City and Liverpool to really challenge for the top? Or, but he hasn't finished his question, so I guess we we'll just have to ask the first one. Um, that's a good question. Uh... I don't, yeah, like, I don't think that he will better what he's already done. I don't think they will win the Premier League or win the Champions League um, in the next few years. That said, I don't think that there is, I don't think there is nothing left for him to do. I do think that the prospect of integrating these new players into the team, refreshing the team, building a new version of Spurs, that that is like a cool, attractive, exciting idea. Um so just because I don't think Spurs can like outperform the 2016-17 team or the Champions League final run, that you know they, I mean, they could they could win a trophy theoretically, and that would be an amazing thing in itself. Uh, but I do think there is work left to do, even if he can't like exceed the, some of the achievements of the past few years. I don't know about you, Jack, but I'm, I'm fascinated to see what he can make out of a player like Lothelso or in Dembele. Like given what he did with Eriksson, given what he did with Moussa Dembele. Like, I think those are two, at, at that basic level, they're two more talented players. They can certainly do more. So the idea of what he could create out of those ingredients is, like, forget the trophy stuff. Like, as a fan, I just want to see good football. I don't want to see, you know, interesting things happening within football teams. You want to see careers develop. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, of course you do, because you want to see players make that journey from potential to, you know, realised ability. Um, and those are, like, you couldn't ask for, for two better players to, you know, to, to still to be talented, to be first in viable, but also in a, in a sense to still be pliable as well. So you can still create them in whatever way suits you. They're at that age. So it's, it's great. What a project for someone like Pochettino to have. Mm. Uh, Golovin Press asks, why do you think Poch plays Son with Kane uh, when Lucas is there? What value does Son add to Spurs? 
that uh, Lucas apparently lacks. Um, Son is just much better than Lucas. Like he is, there's a theory at Spurs which is that the difference between them is that Lucas is basically the same player that he's always been. Like he's very talented, he can do amazing things. You know, he can score you a hat trick in the Champions League semi final second leg. But he's not really like he's not really a guy to be consistent, to do it week in, week out. Where he's not really much of a learner. That's what that's how they see it. Whereas Son has improved so much since he's been at Spurs. He is an incredibly intelligent player. He takes everything on board. His ability to like process the sort of detailed tactical instructions he gets from Pochettino is second to none. Uh, and he's made himself one of the most consistently dangerous counter attackers and finishers. In the Premier League, he's I think amazing. Son isn't is he? a phenomenal player. Mm. He's like so. A very long time ago, I, I used to do a, a Tottenham podcast, and after the um, after the uh, the five one loss to Newcastle, absolutely had an on air meltdown about Son because he all the things that Jack's just said about his his, his tactical acumen, um, they've developed. They weren't there initially, um, and he would kind of he would take minutes off where he would let you know his winger drift beyond him, or he wouldn't track a fullback or something like that. Um, but he, what he has made of himself is amazing. He was a talented player when he arrived. Now, like you're looking at two-footed, you know, sort of forward who can play all the way across the front line, can potentially play as almost a centre forward if you absolutely need him to. Um, his stamina is incredible. Like people talk about his acceleration. Look at his acceleration over long distances. It's kind of like a Gareth Bale-ish trait, which is which is really, I mean, it's it's. Um, and he played the most games of anyone last year. Absolutely, and you mix in the travel, the jet lag, um, the the burden that places on a player. Like his, what he's done with his career, I have the utmost admiration for it because he he could play for, I mean, he could certainly play you know, a role for any side in the country. Uh, yeah, I think yeah, he's totally. for any team. No, any I, team I, I think I think he's a better footballer than Sadio Mane. I know that's a little bit, um, that's a little bit of a fan's opinion. I think there's more to him. I think there's a more consistent product to him. I think you could certainly make a case for saying that he could he could do something for uh, Real Madrid. Barcelona is a bit of a different issue, but certainly all of these all of these clubs are right at the crest of the game. I think he'd look amazing at City or Liverpool. Yeah, because he, he's got so much. He's got this like if you think about what it takes to be a forward for City or Liverpool, yeah. you need number one like in, intelligence, elite technical skill, speed, tactical flexibility. Um, hunger without the ball and he ticks every single box he would like if you know I mean I'm t this is total speculation I'm not suggesting that it's going to happen or might happen but if say City were to sell Leroy Sane can like n name me a better replacement yeah. for him than Son well even in the absence with his injury currently yeah or the same the season, or the right? same goes f f for Mane at Liverpool exactly that did you uh, did you guys read the um, I, th I think it was a tweet rather than an article but Rory Smith raised this point last season he was like why you know, all these Tottenham players that habitually get connected with moves elsewhere, he's the one that never does, which is really interesting because he's, he is, I mean, I, I'd he say he's been under one, the radar, which is very strange because he's playing, he's playing in a very visible, um, for a very visible side he is, in the most his, visible his league. His improvement has been gradual and consistent and he hasn't, he didn't go away one summer and come back with a hundred muscles like Gareth Bale did. You know, he, 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 he. What are you he, suggesting? Nothing. I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying he spent a lot of time lifting baked bean tins. Uh, Someone's you know, getting an email bath. from Jonathan Barnett. <laughs> I, I said nothing. Okay. I'm saying I'm just in, just in terms of um, all the, you know you see it with with all kinds of players who have you know spikes in terms of their performance. Son has been someone who's kind of steadily increased. You know, it's like rising damp. You know, you, you, maybe you notice it initially, and then all of a sudden your house falls down. Do you know you're, another thing that you put into that? Good attitude. Mm -hmm. like a superstar of the game um, obviously there are uh, quite a few South Korean journalists who follow Tottenham around to cover Son um, and I've talked to a few of them about how just how famous he is in South Korea and he is a a star a national celebrity not the most famous person in South Korea their most famous um, sporting personality and with that generally especially now in 2019 usually comes a huge ego yeah. and difficulty I mean, we're not going to, we're not here to throw other players under the bus, but that's certainly the expectation in, you know, sort of around the kind of the um, the family of, of outstanding players at the moment. Yeah. And he's not like that. And he's so that cool makes him guy. more attractive. You'd be like, you know, this is a guy that has all of these attributes, these abilities and doesn't cause a problem. And I want to be friends it. with him. Yeah. He seems like such a smiley, happy guy. Mm -hmm. Infectious positivity. Infectious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one more question here from uh, Chirag Dua. 
What are your thoughts on Harry Winks? I see the coach. Uh, this doesn't make sense. The coach likes him. Do you see him as a key player, or would you prefer Ndombele and Sissoko to be in the starting eleven? You talked about him already. Yeah, you? I'm a big Harry Winks fan. Uh, I think he gives Spurs something which I think nobody else really gives them in the same way. Like he's the control of possession from deep, the like the ability to set the tempo, a kind of busyness with with and without the ball, always on the move. Uh, yeah, I'm mean, I'm a really big Winks fan. I think he improved. I think the whole team just looks better when he's in it. I think that's also true of the England national team as well, as it happens. Um, I do think there is like a question as to how Spurs get all their best midfielders into the team together. Uh, I don't think the answer to that is in Dombele and Sissoko. I mean, frankly, I think Sissoko, you know, Sissoko was amazing last year. He surprised everyone. But is he good enough for a Spurs team at their best? No. Like even yesterday, like tw- you know. Just tr- Twice in the second half, he broke through into the box at the end and should have won then, the game. Yeah, and then should've messed it up. He just he, he he is not technically good enough to play for his first team that wants to come third. Uh, so I, but yeah, whereas Wings is good enough for his first team that wants to play third, so I would definitely have him in the team. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I'm a massive Harry Wings fan. I think that the Sissoko point is a good one. I think he was excellent last season, but out of necessity. So he 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 kind of um, he was able to fill a huge yawning chasm that developed you know post Musa Dembele's sale and issues with Eric Dyer um I think there's no problem in having a player that you know can do very good things against the bottom 10 sides in the league but when you have when, when, when you have opportunities sort of scarce opportunities to develop in those games and I'd add in the chance he missed at Liverpool last season at Anfield um to that you need someone with a little bit more attacking ability and that's quite a broad description but he just doesn't have that he is a um he's not a water carrier but his usefulness ends at the edge of the penalty box you just can't you he can't be a part of an attacking move beyond a certain point and that's it's a little bit of a problem and it's not it's not a um you don't see that player at liverpool or manchester city okay we will end with this question from lewis chappelle uh what was your what is your take on the ryan sessignon deal uh, Lewis does write more, but I think that's uh, concise enough to... What, what part of the Ryan Sessignon deal? The... Maybe, well, maybe the extra bit of the question adds some more context. I think about the player himself. Right, uh, Lewis says, I personally think he isn't the player he was during his first season. What, what I'll say about him is is he's, he's, he's very smart. He's very well raised. He's got a good family behind him. Um, he... I think he suffered a little bit because he was missold. Like people, people assumed he was Gareth Bale because of where he played on the pitch, and he's just nothing like that as a footballer. He's, I think uh, that's happened to so many left backs yeah, since Gareth Bale, hasn't but, it? Yeah, I, I agree. But Bale was Bale was kind of an unthinking player when he was at Spurs. He was just he was very dynamic, very capable, you know. But he was more instinctive. Cessnion is a more thoughtful footballer. Like he, you know, his success um, at Fulham under Jukanovic was kind of a lot of it was based on on tactical awareness, being in the right position at the right time, being able to read the players that developed around him and capitalising on it as it developed. Um, I really like him as a footballer. I also think I like him because of that sort of intellectual profile. Like you you give someone like that to Pochettino. He's another one we, we probably should have added into a, the sort of fun little projects because like he could be anything that Pochettino wants him to be. Um, you know, he's, uh, I, I think Spurs have got a terrific player. Yeah, big Sessignon big ses- fan. Yeah. Um, I think he'll do really, really well with the right coaching. Um, he's obviously incredibly talented, and Pochino hasn't really had like a y- a young raw project like him to work on for the last few years. Winks is probably the last yeah, one, yeah, because you know, the profile of the squad has got a little bit older. Yeah. So from a, you know that's one of the reasons why it's so exciting to see how to see how he gets on with him. At, certainly him, him and also in Dombele. Mm-hmm. Great. Uh, Jack, thanks so much for coming in. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. It was lovely to meet you. Uh, Seb, thank you for coming. I sat on the floor of a train to get here this morning. Okay. Yeah. Well, it was nice to see you. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we will be back next week with something, another thing. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>